15. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 15 Patreon subscribers away from achieving this goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, our newest sponsor who won best in show at the Richmond Expo. You'll also be a part of our private Facebook group community, weekly prize giveaways, and so much more. If you would like to support our show, check out our Patreon link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we've got a really special guest. Uh, what, I, what I love about this show is people really kind of think it's funny. It's like when I say, like, just message me someone I need to reach out to. Because like, you know, I'm so big in just this area and the cool stories and the small businesses that really make this grow. And I had multiple people, including, you know, SB Fishing, said like, you got to reach out to Matt. And problem with being a small business owner is you're a busy guy. And I am so honored that I was able to cut out some time with this guy who really, I don't even know if it's a business or an art, what you do. I really, after looking at some of this shit, it seems more like art. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of both, man. I appreciate you uh, having me on, man. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's crazy, man. I mean, all the Jumbo content and stuff, it kind of just took off. But you know, I've been a welder and fabricator my entire life. It's kind of a family business. So I was kind of born with a TIG rod in my hand and uh, it just took off, man. Boating and marine industry, fishing, that's all like my passion. So it's just, it was inevitable that I was going to build boats because that's, I love being out on the water. And, you know, you have the ability to transform something and make it what you want. And, you know, it's kind of, where I, I come in with my niche. How though, like, how do you go from being a welder, which is a great career path, especially nowadays to, I want to work on boats to like, I want this to be my thing. Um, mainly for me, man, it's, it's kind of a long story, but it started with me. First time I ever got a boat. Um, I wanted to get the kids out on the water and I bought like a little 14 foot John boat. Cause that's all I could afford. I had, you know, three kids and I decided, hey, you know, it's all aluminum. I always wanted to do it, but when I was younger, I just never had the time to sit down and do it. And I just really sat down and figured out how I wanted to build this boat. And I did all the aluminum framing, welded everything. And, you know, it was my first build, a lot of wood and stuff that, you know, I don't use anymore, but it was a learning experience. And once I built that first boat, man, that it was just all downhill from there. It was crazy how fast things exploded at that point. but. How, yeah, many, just a little passion. how many years ago, like from your first boat till now, like, like how long? It's kind of crazy. You asked that because the first boat that I built for myself was like 12 years ago. And I built my first customer boat, uh, 10 years ago this month. So the customer wow. actually brought it back to the shop and I'm going to be doing some new modifications to it. But I mean, the thing looks amazing, man. It's crazy how it's like it's been just frozen in time because he doesn't fish much. He keeps it in the garage, and the thing is, it's mint. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. So you go from your first boat. This is something maybe I want to do. And now you know your Instagram following is massive. Over 11k followers on Instagram alone. It it's insane. Like, but there's that step in everyone's mind when it's like, this is something I'm going to take to the next level. Do, do you remember that moment mentally when you're like, this is something I want to pursue? I definitely remember that moment very vividly. Um, <clears throat> you know, I started building these boats for customers on the side. I built that first boat and I actually met a guy at the ramp and he was interested in the boat and he traded me title for title for like a 20 foot striper sea swirl, uh, sea swirl. It was like a fishing ski boat and I had three kids and the wife liked it. So it worked out perfectly, but he took that boat, fished some tournaments. And then within a month, I had a guy calling me up, Hey, look, can you do this? And eventually over the next year, I got in to start building these things. But, um, you know, just building the couple of boats, the first two that I did, you know, how fishermen are, everybody knows everybody, everybody talks. 
and everybody wants something done. And in my area, there's a huge calling for these smaller John boots because we have so many tournament trails and it was a whole new world to me. Like when I, I realized, you know, this is what I want to do. But I think when I realized that moment is when I started getting on social media a lot. And that was three years ago. I first started my uh, YouTube channel then. And I saw all these other people that are, you know, putting out products and builds and just converting John boots and doing things with boats that I was like, man, I can do that. I could, I could make that cooler or better. And that's, that was the moment for me. And that was the moment right before I hit up SB fishing and Matt Strykel. And, you know, that, that was it. That was the moment when I talked to him, I was like, we're going to do this and there's no turning back now. <laughs> How did that go for what you can, like, if you, if you wanted to close anything, like, I, I guess not the conversation itself, but you mentally be like, I'm just going to reach out to SB fishing, like, and do this. Like, like, like it takes a lot as a business owner to have the courage to like, I'm going to put myself out there on social media. I'm going to do this. And then that moment of like, Hey, Matt, what do you think? Yeah. Um, well, it was kind of like, I've been building the boats before, like I said, it's been almost 10 years. So I had a lot, a lot of builds I've done and the clientele was built up there and I was just doing it as a side thing originally. But then I was like thinking, like I saw a bunch of other guys doing, I was like, I could do this for real. And one of my buddies that I met on Instagram, Sham for real, he, uh, he had built a couple of boats too. And he was like, man, all you gotta do is, you know, reach out to a couple of YouTubers and see if somebody wants to collaborate. And then that will help spark your YouTube channel. Yep. And at the time, I had no idea how to record stuff. I mean, if I would, if I could go back ten years and have all the footage from the builds I have done, oh my god! I mean, I probably have a hundred thousand followers already Dude. on YouTube. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's how it happened, man. And he he told me about SB, and uh, he was like, he's local to you. He's you know in Virginia. He's only like a, um, two hours away or something. And uh, he actually reached out to him and gave him my number, and he called me and. It was super random because I actually had a lot of friends in common with uh, Matt Strykel and uh, my brother. And it was just it was just meant to be, man. It just I felt like I'd known him a lot longer, even though I just met him and talked for 10 minutes on the phone. I, it just felt like, uh, you know, things happen for a reason. And I felt like that was one of those things. You mentioned you had a brother and your, your brother was kind of this thing. Does he fish, too? Oh, uh, he's not a big fisherman, man. My brother. Um, Andy Downs, he's got uh, his own business too. I mean, we work together in professional welding, and then oh, I have cool. Trick Tens, and he has his own company called Brimmy Strong, and he's kind of just like me, except he's into working out and um, weightlifting. So he builds all types of different you know, oh, that's weightlifting cool. equipment and uh, racks. And I mean, he's got stuff. It's crazy, man. I mean, I look at the stuff and I'm like, man, that's, that's really cool. And then I look at the other people that are building at big companies and the stuff that he's doing, man, it's just, you know, it's that little bit of extra flair that you can give things when you have the ability and the knowledge about metal and how to make stuff and the tools and machinery. And it's that little bit of love and that passion that I think really, you, is where you can take like a normal thing and turn it into something that's, you know, extravagant. And that's, that's what he does. So it's cool. pretty cool, man. And then together we're like business partners in professional welding. So that's cool. It works out well. I mean, you mentioned, you know, passion, flair, how did the tiny boat nation, how did these, these pimped out tens, what made it blow up? Like it has on social media. <clears throat> um, to be honest with you, man, like, uh, that was kind of like when, when I, when I said I started getting online and, you know, doing social media and stuff and researching, that was kind of where I had found that there's other people doing what I'm doing. And I thought it was cool. And, um, you know, I wanted to just, just put myself out there a little bit more, let people know what I was doing. But I think that a lot of it came down to like <clears throat> COVID man, like COVID for me, like it really changed a lot because a lot of people were stuck in the house everybody's got all these mandates and you know <clears throat> they're at home watching youtube and that helped me out because that was when i first started my channel and i feel like i got a lot of new viewers and subscribers that normally i probably wouldn't have got but people wanted something to do they needed something to tinker with and it's just like a go-kart or a dirt bike or a vintage car you know they can go get a john boat and 
they can make it how they want it and customize it. So I think that's kind of, for me, that was where I saw a big spike in the industry with it. I think it really, and I think to, to piggyback off that, it's <clears> also <throat> this, and this is just my hypothesis on this, like it's not about the boat anymore. It's about the accessories to an extent. So if you have a tricked out John boat and you have the forward facing sonar, the live well, everything, you can beat up a dude that has jack shit on his boat and his boat might cost a billion dollars, but it's about how you customize that rig to suit your purposes as an angler. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, the whole way that it kind of took off for me around here was because we got like seven uh, big lakes that are in the Suffolk area. And I've never really been a big bass fisherman, but there's tons of trails. I mean, there's probably two dozen trails of guys that fish those tournaments religiously every weekend. And these lakes have 9.9 .9 restricted uh, outboards and you can't have anything longer than a 16 foot boat. Damn. And a lot of these guys are, you know, there's a, a good variety of people that fish them, but there's a lot of these guys have been fishing these tournaments for 20, 30 years. They're older. They got money. They got full size bass boats. They fish the full, you know, bass masters trails and the James and stuff. But, they like fishing these local lakes because it's close and there's a lot of fish in there, man. So they have the money. They just don't have the means to turn their boat into the same as their bass cat or, you know, so that that's kind of where I have my niche. I can come in and they got a, a $150,000 Phoenix boat and they got a, a 10 boat that has nothing in it and they have the money to do it. So that, that's kind of where I found my niche to do it. And, it's cool, man, because like you get some of those customers and you could tell instantly, like if you got somebody that's got a John boat that their granddad gave them that's been sitting in the backyard for 30 years, or if this guy just bought this welded John boat and he's got all the electronics, the new trolling motors and all the new latest and greatest technology going into the thing. And he's got the pocketbook to make it happen. That's really what I like, man, because I, I want to do that stuff. I mean, I try to help everybody, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to do the big builds because that's that's where the money's at. And that's that's where I really get the satisfaction out of it, because a lot of it just started as like I said, side work and just because I like doing it. I thought it was fun to see the finished product and put it all together. It's like a puzzle for me. Well, and for the people at home, you know, they're, that are probably not watching this, but are listening on, on Apple or, or Spotify or iTunes, when you mean like the big build is where you, what you prefer, what would a big build mean or entail a big build uh would pretty much be like neptune king neptune that's the boat that i did with matt strikel and um you know something like a big build is going to be a good 20 30 thousand dollar boat build and that's just like my work and the turf going into it you know that seems crazy to a lot of people but uh it's really not man i mean anybody that knows anything about boats you know it adds up quick you can spend 20 grand getting electronics in your boat. You know, you could, you could spend another 20 getting me to do all the custom metal fabrication is it's kind of an art. I like laying it out. You know, there's so much I've learned along the years as far as like weight distribution and you know, where to put certain things in the boat, how to fabricate things to make them not only look good, but they gotta be functional and they gotta be able to hold up to the wear and tear of a fisherman and they need to be lightweight so that they're fast because nobody wants to be the slowest boat out there, period. I mean, they just don't. I mean, they, it doesn't matter. People could tell you they don't care how fast they go. Everybody cares how fast you go in a boat at the end of the day. I like driving boats and I like to go fast. So it's pretty ex important. Explain that a little bit more about like weight distribution because I think that's interesting because a lot of these boats, especially let's say an electric motor, electric motor yeah. only boat, you're not getting on plane. And so I'm assuming there's a difference on how you'd weigh a boat with a 250 versus an electric motor only lake boat. That's yes, that's very true. Now there are some electric motors out there now that uh, they're insane. I mean, they got 25, 50 horsepower electric outboards. Holy shit. And these guys are running 30 miles an hour, just like they got a gasoline outboard on there. There's a company called stealth that's been making them and they actually use the Yamaha housing for like the 50 horsepower outboard and they completely gut it and they put a uh, new electronic i mean new internals into it and it runs off of 
batteries and they don't have a long lifespan as far as like runtime, but um, they got some crazy stuff, man. There's a couple different companies doing it. Um, All right, I gotta you know, there's this tons. Up. Yeah, there you go, right there. That's a that's one of the, that's like a Yamaha outboard housing wow. or a Tahatsu. It's just it's insane how fast these things are now. But Jesus, wait, distribution. Miles an hour. Yeah, fifty. That's a fifty yeah. horsepower. Jesus but, Christ. <laughs> yep. But th then that's the thing. It's like those motors, you're going to spend probably 10 grand on a motor. And then you're going to have to buy a battery. That's probably going to be about another five to 10 grand too. So you're going to have $20,000 into the day wrapped up into an electric outboard. That's going to be sick. You're going to get to run, you know, 30, 40 miles an hour maybe. But at the end of the day, like it's only going to run that for 30 45 minutes if you're going wide open so it's a different world man there's electric only is really big on weight distribution because you know they a lot of those guys aren't running these stealth motors they're expensive they have trolling motors and That's electric insane. outboards that are like five ten horsepower outboards that don't really get on plane like you were saying so it's weird with the electric only stuff those guys they like to weigh down the front of the boat and they have no weight in the back so it just runs huh. faster that way for some reason. Um, but that's, that's, that's how they do it. Most of the electric only tournaments around here, these guys are averaging anywhere from five to six miles an hour. If you're seven plus, then you're, you're elite in the electric only world, which is crazy to me. Cause for me, that's just starting my engine. Up, you know what I mean? It, it, it is. And it's there. I really think it does is depends it's state dependent where like a Georgia or really a Virginia, we have so many electric motor only lakes. It makes sense for maybe that's something you'd want to do. The first thing that comes to my mind though, is how many effing batteries do you need to get? I mean, you're talking, you're a Tesla basically at that point, it's gotta be insane. Yeah, for sure. I'm building a, a an 1860 low roughneck right now for electric only for the uh, rip and lips open series. And, um, <clears throat> that thing is cool, man. It's, I just got it wrapped the other day, but he's got three 120 amp hour batteries just for his outboard. And then he's got five more hundred amp hour batteries there for the trolling motor and all the electronics that go in there. Those 120 amp batteries are 22 inches by like 10 inches. I mean, and that's one, he's got three of them in the back of the boat. It takes up the entire mm -hmm. back storage area. It's just, it, is, it's the a lot build, of batteries, man. is the build on your Instagram? Uh, I think there's a there's a clip of it getting wrapped on there. Uh, I'm getting ready to drop a video on it. And I'll send you some some more pictures of it. Um, you see that wrap on the? Oh, yep, this one. That's right here. that's the first boat I ever built right there. Oh, th this one right here. That boat. Yep, that is the first boat <clears throat> I ever built. That boat is ten years old, man. Jeez, dude, and that thing is crazy. How clean that thing still looks. That guy took care of it. But we're gonna be doing some modifications to that one. And my buddy that got that. Uh, build done he actually is moving so i'm storing it for him until he can get into his new place and probably going to clean it up and do some new stuff to it since it's been a while you know okay you get a boat do you have a notebook where you craft your idea because this is this is not this is art this ain't just like a mechanic throwing tires on a car like no. do you just visualize this in your head and not write anything down like how the <clears throat> hell this is a ton of work but like how do you mentally like picture what you want to do well, it depends on the build right out the gate. You know, majority of the boats I build are tournament and John boats because those are the guys that are going to be out there every weekend using the boat. And I know what they need. You know, they got to have a live well. They got to have storage space and need batteries and like, you know, some of them want rod lockers and stuff. And the main thing is the weight distribution because I built a ton of boats and, you know, I learned the hard way on some stuff about what's good locations to put things that weigh a lot like a live well a live well weighs a lot you know water is like eight pounds per gallon so you got a 20 gallon live well in there you know you got a couple hundred pounds and and just a live well and then you got the outboard motor and getting the offset right and where all their tackle is going to be stored they some of these guys might have 50 pounds of tackle in the boat you know so it's like yeah. you gotta you gotta figure that out um as to how it's going to set up. But for the most part, uh, as far as the tournament boats go, I've got it kind of figured out. I'll, when they come in, I'll kind of go over with them and draw like a bird's eye view of the boot and then just, you know, 
what do you want where and your options are kind of limited on how it's going to work and be fast if you want me to make sure your weight distribution is right so they're all kind of similar you know what i mean and it's like a car they got four tires and you know it's they're different in a way but they're all kind of similar neptune was outside of the box i mean that one was just something that i wanted to do because let me pull that up for you so we can we'll walk through your baby here let me see if i can find it because yeah like i think th this is one of your like let me see if i can find a good photo of it i think this is a good photo of it. Right yeah here. that's neptune right there but so, that build was like that was just one that i was collecting stuff from you know, over the past six years of doing this I was like i'm gonna build myself a boat and that's the one that I built the SB's running and uh, I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag, but that boat is about to be going up for sale this month. Oh, so snap. Somebody's going to get a, a little piece of history with the trick tens build right there. That's, that is one badass rig. What made it badass? Like, like you said, like this was like a big, this was a big moment in your career of building. Was it just like, I'm going to throw every trick I know into the book into it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I knew that I wanted it to be crazy. I mean, you look at it and obviously the colorway of it's insane, but it had to be that way because nobody knew who I was, you know, and it was like I had a small following. I mean, I Instagram only had like 500 followers at the time and I had just started YouTube. I didn't even have 100 subscribers. I had two videos that were terrible. And um, this was like my big chance to do it. And when I first kicked the idea to Matt Strykel, he was all about it. He wanted to get a new job, but he'd seen the stuff I've been doing. And um, I had just finished a boat for Chaz Carrington, who's like a local fishing pro. And uh, he actually got to check that out when he came down the first time to meet me. But um, he wanted to have something like a black boat with some, you know, wood grain brown turf. And I was like, dude, this is my like statement build. This thing's got to be crazy, brother. Like, I'll build it for you. But I'm picking the colorways out for it. And that, that's let the why artist, so let happy. the artist be the artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get you. Yeah, I was like, you, you know, I, it's got to be outside the box. Uh, and I love those colors of that thing, man. I think it's sick. Man. What made it, you decide it, on those it, colors? Thing. Well, there's so many different uh, colors of that turf that go into the boat. I mean, there's literally hundreds of samples. And I stared at a bunch of them. But that one is the blue and black and teal ortho deck. And, uh, I don't know. It just kind of, I'd never seen a boat with it on it. Mm. And that's kind of my thing. Like I hate doing boats that look just like builds that other people have done. And I wanted something that everybody was going to remember. So that boat is something that to this day, people hit me up and they're like, yeah, yeah. I remember you did that, that bill with that blue boat. Everybody's that blue. They might not remember it's called Neptune, but they know that that blue boat. So that's true. It worked out well for me. It, it did. And I just, I do love the, um, the artistic integrity about like, I'm, I have a vision and I'm going to make the vision like work. It's not just about it. It's like, I, I have this, this idea in my head and come hell or high water, I'm going to see that. And that's what I appreciate about so many of these designs on your, on your, on your site is the amount of not time and care, but like, you know, where you're going to go with this. It seems like before you ever, you know, cut a piece of metal. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely how my brain works, man. I mean, I've been, you know, doing metal fab for 21 years. So it's like, I've kind of learned how to look at something and see how it's put together and how to take it apart. And I always stay like three steps ahead of myself in my head. So when I'm doing stuff and I'm trying to explain it to other people, they don't see like where it's going until I get there a lot of times. And I have a problem working with other people, like with getting help on stuff because it takes a while, man, like to build that, uh, you know, that relationship to where I like teaching people stuff. I do. I like sharing knowledge. I like learning stuff. But, you know, once you it's like anything, if you've done something long enough, you know, then you kind of have an idea how it works. And it's instinct, too. It's yeah, like, it's just, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's all like it's, it's part of the game, man. I mean, before I was doing these boats, you know, we've done tons of fabrications for stuff like. I built lots of stainless sinks and cabinets for hospitals and oh, cool. just all kinds of crazy stuff. And then you also branched out a little bit too to saltwater and jet boats, correct? 
I did. That was probably one of my favorite builds, man. That jet boat project. Um, that guy hit me up right after uh, he was a big fan of uh, SB Fishing TV, and he hit me up right after we did that video, and um, he told me he had this project with the jet boat, and that he had started on it, and he was kind of at a standstill because he didn't have the fabrication skills and machinery to make it what he wanted it to be. But dude, that thing turned out sick. It was so fun to drive. I mean, it's a 16 foot boat. It's got a 180 horsepower Yamaha jet ski engine in it. Jesus. And that thing flies. We did a walkthrough with a uh, Matt Strykel in it. And that was the only time I got to drive it was when I took it out with him. And uh, it was just so much fun, dude. I really want one. I'd like to build one for myself one day. I learned a lot on that project. And um, what did you learn? Just, uh, just a lot about weight distribution in that project, too, man. Like throughout the whole build, series people were just commenting oh that thing's gonna be too heavy that motor that boat's gonna sit too low in the water and dude we put the thing in the water and the back end of it almost came out of the water it drafted in like a half inch of water in the back of the boat i mean it it was crazy how well the, the weight distribution worked out with that boat but it was cool to learn how to do the you know the exhaust for having an inboard motor it kind of kills the whole build as far as like space in it because you got a, a gigantic you know four cylinder motor in, in the back of the boat but i mean the amount of like acceleration that thing has it's got you know two speeds here and gone so where the hell did you get the motor from like is that something like so, he supplied or did you get it yourself <laughs> Yes, when he brought me the boat, he had uh because he owns a construction company too, and he's got some welders that work for him. But they had taken that was a, a sixteen forty eight express originally, and they took the floor out of it and kept the two sides, and they welded in a three sixteenths thick aluminum floor. It got up to the bow where it rolls up for the the semi V in it, and they couldn't finish it. But he did have the motor sitting in there, and it was just a bare hole at the time that I got it. And then I just started fabricating it, man. And it just turned out to be sick. So how is definitely a sick build, dude. It's insane. Like, is this a like two years? Like how the hell long does it take you to do something like this? <laughs> this project did take a while. It was a little over a year, um, in building that whole thing, but it was kind of one of those things where he brought it to me originally, we kicked around ideas and then I kind of started framing it. Once I got, you know, the main framework figured out, he took it back and he had to get the rest of the motor hooked up and figure out all the, the controls and he had to order all the cables and everything. Cause it's like, um, it's almost, it's like a plug and play type of deal. There's mm. a lot of these companies that are building these boats, like, um, what is it? Rock proof boats. And that's kind of where we got a, a collaboration of the ideas for that rig was from some of the stuff that they build. And these boats start out at like 80 K they are yeah. not cheap boats. So they're, they're expensive, but um, yeah, so he, it was just like back and forth and he lives seven and a half hours away from here. So every time he had to take the boat back and get somebody to do something else, as far as motor wise, he'd send one of these guys down to pick it up and trailer it back. That boat went back and forth. I think six times all Is in he all before it was finished. Is he north of you near the Susquehanna? Yeah, he I he he fished up in the Roanoke River area and stuff. So Okay, I'm he's closer exactly, to me. Yeah, but he uh he does a lot of like striper and trout fishing up in the shallow waters, man. It's like some of the rivers and, and waterways that he fishes is just, you know, a foot of water and the water's been so low, he said that he hadn't even really been able to get out there. And originally that boat had a jet outboard on it and it still wasn't enough. So he built it, uh, or he had me build it so that he can get out there and fish. And he's been using it, man. He sent me some pictures and videos and the thing is sick, man. He, uh, he's had a great time with it. I really want to get back out there and run around and drive the thing, get some more footage of it because we only got to test it that one time for, you know, maybe 30 minutes and. It's just a lot that goes into it with the whole way that the uh, the thing that's, handles and stuff. It's it's like a jet ski, but he's got another one he wants me to do, and that might be coming down the pipelines here for too long. How if somebody wanted to like get a boat made from you? I mean, I'm assuming at this point there's probably like a three year wait list, right? 
Um, the wait list is kind of long. Um, <laughs> it's about a year, but um, you know, that's just for like a full build project. I do, I do a lot of other builds and stuff too. Um, that smaller stuff. Cause I mean, a lot of people don't have $10,000 to put into the metal work of their build, but they might have two grand and they might want to do the build in stages. So that's how a lot of my customers are. They're all returning customers regardless, but a lot of them do them in stages. And that's how I kind of lay all my boats out because I know that if I'm going to build this guy a floor and a back deck, he's coming back in the next year, probably to get this front deck done, a live well put in. So I, I kind of take that into consideration. So everything kind of gets built the same way, regardless if it's a $2,000 build or a ten or $20,000 build. So, so generally speaking, I, I could be wrong. I'm misinterpreting this. You don't work on just one boat for a year and then somebody else. You have a couple of people you try to bounce between? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for okay. sure. Um, like right now, I'm doing the, uh, the, the 1860 low roughneck, and I'm doing that at my shop. And that's the one that we just got wrapped. And then at my house, I'm doing my big build of the year. Now, I'll usually do full builds at my house. And in between doing like a full build, you know, I'll do a, a, a job that might take two or three days or a weekend or something like that just to kind of keep the money flowing and stuff. But okay. same thing at the shop. You know, I got guys that are coming in with a two-day build and I'll do stuff like that. But gotcha. the Project Expo that I'm doing right now, that thing is crazy, man. Like that is going to be the new statement. For everything that I've done up until this point, that boat is it. I mean, I, King Neptune is sweet. I basically do one big build a year. I try to do them, you know, at the end of the year around the holidays when I have a little bit of downtime and the business is usually a little slower. And um, that's kind of the way I, I like to use that time to, you know, productively. And uh, I built Billy's Badass Boat, the Creature Build, uh, last year. And then this year I'm doing Project X, which is going to be, it's going to be cool shit, man. I'm almost getting to the point where I can get this thing uh, painted and uh, it's got custom wrap going on it. It's got custom turf, which is the first time I've used custom turf. So it's, it's going to be cool, man. It's a, it's a big budget build for sure. Definitely a big budget build. When can people start uh, cruising your social media to watch that build? When do you think ballpark? Well, I mean, the, I've got episodes of it already up on my uh, YouTube channel. I think there's five episodes of it already or four episodes or something. But um, it's I've got, a you know, it's all over my social medias. It's got uh, some stuff on Instagram. And, um, but the video, the build videos, a lot of the YouTube guys, they do like one video of the whole boat. And for me personally, I can't do that because it's too much work for me because it's going to take me a year to edit the footage True. of a six month project or four month project. So I, I'd break them up in like 20 minute, 30 minute tops videos. And that helps me with editing and getting videos out. So most of the build series run anywhere from eight to like 15 episodes. It'll be about 20 to 30 minute episode videos. So. And then as always guys, with all these things, link in the episode description to everything that we're talking about today. Um, is carpet dead? I, I I listen to you, Matt, and so many people. If you have a bass boat or something like that, sell them on why you should be going away from carpet because I feel like carpet's a thing of the past. I mean, it kind of is, man. I mean, obviously they still use it. They put it in all the new boats. Uh, I mean, not all of them, but a majority of them. And it's not that it's like a terrible thing, but personally for me I, I mean i like the turf i mean the look of it like the cnc cut turf that i'm getting ready to put in this boat that's kind of like the only missing link for what i haven't had and it just it allows you to you know express yourself in the turf you can have your custom cut logos wherever uh, you want on a hatch or you can have a design you can have your favorite football team you can have whatever you want literally it's just like having a wrap you can put any picture into the thing you want so it's really kind of, it, it's, it's not even in the same ballpark with carpet. I guess you could get carpet decals, but you, it's never going to be comparable as far as, you know, the cool factor of having carpet decals or having a custom CNC cut, you know, deck turfing that's got three different colors in it and patterns. And so it's really, to me, I have a tracker that has carpet in it. I 
want to gut this thing out and do it <laughs> one of these days, but I just haven't had time, man. It's like the barber that needs a haircut, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, but um, yeah, I, I mean, a carpet is just one of those things I just feel like, you know, it, it, it gets wet, it holds the water. I know if you've ever been in a boat and you, you're out and it rained or the boat got wet and you got to kneel down to get something and then mm-hmm. your whole pants are soaking wet and it's like, you know, it gets dirty. You got to get your vacuum cleaner out there and vacuum it with your house vacuum cleaner. So, I mean, you, you sell, you, you sold me on it. I, have you ever <laughs> thought about like getting some help? Because this seems exhausting. Like the amount of work you probably put in on a weekly basis. Yes, um, I have. And I had uh, one of my employees, Austin, helping me out and he bought a house and moved. Like it was crazy. It was working great. He learned a lot. And, um, he was killing it, man. Cause like what, what holds me up the most with everything is like my online orders because I build a lot of the like drop in hatches and oh. that's the main seller is like the hatch doors because you know, everybody's building their own boat and they get to a spot where like, Oh, I want a custom door that's going to fit in here. It's gotta be this size. And that's kind of where I make, you know, a lot of my, <clears throat> that's where I come in handy because I can make those overnight if I have to, cause I have the machinery to do it. It's all built in house. So there's no outsourcing. I don't rely on anybody for anything. And that's where my prices come in cheaper than pretty much everybody's because I'm getting the stuff directly from the mill and it's going from me to you. There's no more hands in the cookie jar or, you know, markups. Obviously I got to make a living, but I'm pretty fair with my pricing. So those, uh, online orders though, they catch up to you quick. And that's why I do need some help with that. Uh, if I could find, you know, some good aluminum welder, but it's tough, man. We've got three employees and a lot of our other works kind of slowed down the boat business. I don't think it will ever slow down because it doesn't matter if people don't have money for food, <laughs> they're going to have money to go fishing. You know how fishermen are. Especially in your area and in, in Virginia and in the DMV and because everyone's like, oh, the DMV is only Northern Virginia bullshit. Richmond's part of the DMV. It's like it's just with all that government money and then Norfolk, like it's its own bubble there with all the veterans and stuff. So it's insane. Yeah, it's it's a big fishing area, man. It's cool. And we had a hell of a year. I mean, uh, this was like the best trout season that we've probably had in the past, like, I don't know, five, six years. I mean, there were guys slaying them. It, and um is this the I best trout fishing ever to. like it might be man I, I mean when i was a kid i don't remember the trout fishing being this good yeah i mean we've had a couple of rough years but we had a mild winter and that helps a lot too because you know if you have that big freeze we lost i think it was three or four years ago and we had a big freeze we had snowstorms and i mean there was thousands of trout just floating in the river that didn't make it when the water tips dropped so low this year was kind of mild and we had a lot of a lot of good fishing trips out there and and i fish a lot of elizabeth river and um Hmm. we ran we actually uh, helped host a tournament my buddy uh his name is bucky with triwave youtube channel but he did uh his first tournament on elizabeth river and um it was pretty cool man we had like 75 boats turnout wow and um first place was like 33 pound bag of speckled trout uh for five fish so holy shit lots of citations caught out there man and then on top of that uh you know the menhaden population seems like it's doing a little better out in the bay in the ocean area around here and that had brought in some bigger stripers a lot of people are catching them big stripers that have been kind of missing you know the past four or five years they're catching those 50 60 inch striper and um those have just kind of been you know, irrelevant. No one's been catching them big ones like that. And a lot of them are on the Eastern shore side and, you know, Cape Charles, but, uh, they also brought in the tuna. And I think that that just has a lot to do with the fact that all the other fish are here because the tuna are just eating the striper and you know, they'll eat anything. So they're following those schools of striper up in here. And, you know, there's a lot of big tuna that got picked up right off the beach, you know, five miles offshore. So beach. They're catching stupid. two to 500. <laughs> pound oh yellowfin God. tuna which is insane I have you caught a tuna probably a decade. i did not man i didn't get a chance to get out oh. there um <clears throat> you know it was cold uh i don't like getting out in the ocean when it's cold i don't mind the rivers and the lakes but uh i don't know man i'll go out on, on a big boat but it's been busy man it's, it's tough to get out there and 
do a lot of fishing um, during the weekdays. And that's when you got to get out there because mm-hmm. you go on the weekends and, you know, it's packed. But uh, I don't know. Maybe next year I'm trying to get me a little ocean boat set up so that I can get out there and do some more saltwater fishing because I yeah. do like it. Man. It's fun. You need to do more fishing, boss. You can't just be working the whole time. <laughs> I know, man. I get out there and hit the river. I like river fishing. Catch a lot of uh, redfish and you know speckled trout while they're here. But the redfish and striper—that's kind of like what I target. And it's fun. I like to catch fish I can eat too. Uh, How I good is the redfish it. fishing? Uh, it's been crazy, man. Like we had a great year for the redfish. I mean, there was times when uh, I went out with a couple of my buddies and <clears throat> just fishing around some of the, the structure of the bridges and stuff around downtown Norfolk and we'll hit spots where we're literally catching overslot drum for two hours. And it doesn't matter <sighs> wow. what you throw in there. We're reeling in, you know, 15, 20 fish a person in an hour and they're all over 30 inches and you can't even keep any of them, but there's just fun. You can fight fish until your arm get tired out there when the red fish are hitting like that. And it's the same way on the ocean. Every now and then you get, you know, get lucky and get on the school of them. And I mean, those, that's where they get big. I took, actually took SB out there with me when uh, he came here and we slayed him, man. We just cut some big 50 pound drum, Kobe and mixed in with them. So that's my type of fishing. I like to catch big fish. I, <laughs> I don't so know. Bass fisherman. I don't know how you could be a bass fisherman if you live in the, the Norfolk area, Florida, the Carolinas on the coast, because that's just so much. Every time I hear you guys say this, like, oh God, I'd rather live where you are than where I am. Because <laughs> I would rather catch a cobia or or some or some striper or redfish. Like that sounds like so much more fun. Yeah, it's cool, man. I mean, I like bass fishing. Um, we got a house in Lake Gaston, so we spend a lot of time up there. Oh, dope. And um, you know, it's just I don't know. I like I said, I like to catch fish I can eat. I'll go out and bass fish a couple times a year. I might fish a tournament or something with somebody if they want to, but other than that, man, I like to just get out there and relax. And the tournament scene is, it's kind of like work too. I mean, those guys it's have true. a lot of dedication to get into the fishing, you know, eight hours a day. And uh, I don't know, man, I like to sit back and relax when I'm fishing. I don't want to have to beat the buzzer and have a timer and stress about size and limit. And mm-hmm. you, when you got money on the line, it's not really like a relaxing atmosphere, you know? No, I, I agree with that. And and being able to find enjoyment, whether it's on an electric motor only lake or an underpowered lake, the river or the Chesapeake Bay. And we have so many opportunities around this area for that. Um, like, honestly, we've covered so much. And I you guys, again, this is more of a sample. If you really want to get more, you know, go, go check out Matt's social media. It's all going to be linked in the episode description. Um, I mean, I trying to think of something else we probably covered we probably covered so much um i mean fiberglass boats do you do any work on that or or build there do. just okay um one one thing that i do a lot of which i've learned a lot about over the past like decade is rigging um hmm. people are scared to do their own rigging you know i do a little bit of outboard motor work not much but even just like maintenance you know but i think that one thing that i really enjoy doing is rigging stuff and hooking up all the new electronics because I get to see all the latest and greatest stuff. And I got guys that every year they go out, they buy the new live scope. They got to have the new graph, the bigger and better everything. And for me, that's cool because I don't have money to buy a, you know, $5,000 12 inch graph just because it came out this year. But I get to install them and I get to learn about how all the new stuff works and the differences in this year's model and last year's mm-hmm. model. And I think that's something that, you know, if you go to a marina and you want them to install a couple of graphs or a, a forward facing sonar or even a trolling motor, it's like you're going to spend a lot of money and you're probably going to have to wait a while if it's during the peak season time and be without your boat. So that's something that I'm really <clears throat> trying to take on more jobs of doing that because. I can do that stuff like that in a day and yeah. that's a done job. It's not like something that's going to drag out for a couple of weeks or a month. It's like, we're going to hook up four graphs. We're going to do this, run the wiring. And, you know, so that, that's something that I do a lot of. And then like 
what comes along with doing that also is a lot of custom battery tray, like battery trays and brackets to hold like um, the connectors for your hubs and you know all the ports and stuff like that so that's something that i really like doing too because you know, I get a lot of guys that have brand new bass boats and a lot of the new bass boats, they don't come with the new trolling motors and all the graphs. A lot of them come with the, you know, kind stock. of bottom of the barrel yeah. stock stuff that comes with it. So they've got all this new stuff they want to put in it. So that's pretty neat too. Cause I get uh, to go through some of their new bass boats and uh, install a bunch of stuff. I had a buddy just bring me a, a, a brand new nitro and uh, a C17 and he never even put it in the water. He just brought it right to me to put his live scope and all his grass. And got to build some different, you know, battery trays and kind of lets me figure out ways that I can kind of, uh, I guess I could like challenge myself to see how I can fit all this stuff into this compartment without taking up extra room and fit it into this little area. And I just build like a custom tray that has, you know, brackets sticking off it to hold hmm. all this stuff together. And, I like doing stuff like that. I think that's cool too. And that's, that's something that there's good money in that too. Cause people oh, yeah. are scared to, to take on a project of wiring all that stuff. And it looks like a lot, but it's, it's not that crazy, man. Once you've done it a couple of times, you know, they're all pretty much about the same. It's so crazy. Cause I remember when like a four bank battery charger became a thing and people were like, Oh, it's just the upper end. That's just going to use a four bank. And now I see like people are like, are we ever going to get a six? It's like, <laughs> it's insane how that's blown up. Like, what do you think, based on all your builds, if, if you run live scope or something like that, what is a good battery? Is lithium all it's cracked up to be? Should you get like a, a 16 volt like Millikan's running? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a good question. Um, a lot of pretty much all the boats that I'm building, these guys have lithium batteries. Now, they're running usually a battery that's strictly for like grass. And then they're running a battery that's strictly for the black box because a lot of those black boxes for the uh, forward facing sonars, they like to have those on their own battery so it doesn't cause interference. And then they got batteries for the trolling motors. So um, I think that for the most part, you could probably get away with like a 50 amp hour battery to run a majority of your grass and stuff. But the trolling motors, you know, 100 amp hours all day or, or bigger. Um, you could probably get away with something smaller, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I run two uh, 100 amp hour batteries for my trolling motor, and then all of my the rest of my graphs and electronics, they're also ran off of a uh, 100 amp hour battery. They're lithium batteries. So I haven't had them long. Um, I actually just got those donated from uh, Lie Time. So we'll be doing a video on that too, let you guys know how those last. Matt. I, I really, I know you're super busy and I really appreciate the time that you cut out for me um, today. Uh, yeah, man. If, if people would like to to follow you or more importantly, would like your business, how can they get a hold of you? Um, the easiest way to get a hold of me is you can send me an email through professionalwelding at gmail.com. Um, you can reach out to me on social media. It's trick tens across all the platforms. And if you guys want to follow me on YouTube, check that out. Maybe I do a lot of cool stuff and you guys will learn a lot of stuff. Cause I like to show what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. And if I make a mistake, you're going to know about it and you'll see how I messed up and then you'll see how we fixed it. So a lot of that is stuff that people I feel like don't really do on a lot of the other channels. I feel like they just show you all the good stuff and they don't really explain how they did stuff. But, um, you know, that's something that I kind of try to, try to share with everybody. But I, if you guys do want any products, you know, you can check out my website. That's tricktensjohnboats.com. And I got a lot of hatches and custom stuff that I'm building. But anything else that you want custom built, just send me an email, professionalwelding at Gmail, and I'll be glad to help you guys out. Guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything we talked about today. I'll also, because of when this episode drops, um, and if Matt's okay with it, the Neptune, because I think you said that's for sale. I'll also link that yes, sir. once that's there, the for sale ad. So if you're interested in buying it, you can go straight through that to go get that as well. Uh, guys, again, please like, subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Um, if you would, please join us on Patreon. Our big goal overall is we're starting a nonprofit to start restocking some of our local bodies of water. If not, just like and subscribe and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. 
Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.